I think somebody is listening to some interesting videos. Perhaps you could mute yourself, please. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes, great. Wow, it's so amazing to have so many people from all over the world. I'm really astonished um, and humbled to have people from all the, over the place. Yeah, I just read from London, from, from Rome, all the way to New Zealand, to California. That's so cool, literally. Like we would have never ever expected to have so many people join such a nerdy topic. Like as if donut economics wasn't enough, we also brought in some history. Um, but here we go. Um, so we are perfectly the right nerdy crowd of people for tonight's session, I hope. Um, yeah, let me just start with some formalities real quick before, before we go ahead. Um, <clears throat> oopsie. Yeah, so welcome again to our little um, shared workshop journey through the past, present and future, as you want to say so, of donor economics um, and donut cities. Um, yeah, basically, uh, just a little etiquette for the start. Um, it would be very nice if you keep yourself muted. Um, have your camera on if you feel like it. Um, it's nice to see people, especially in these digital times, to have some sort of uh, potential for connection also to the visual um, communication channels. And then also, the just for information, the um, session is going to be recorded. Uh, so if you don't feel comfortable with being on the video, um, that would be a very good excuse to turn your video off. Um, exactly. And also, um, the, the, the entire session, um, yeah, ran a bit out of sort of the original scope that we had anticipated. So we had to um, upgrade our Zoom account. We originally <clears throat> expected like perhaps 15 people to show up or 20. <laughs> now we have 200 registrations. There's 85 in the room right now. Um, Zoom allows you to, um, with, the, with the basic version, to host up to 100 people. Um, and since we couldn't really plan with how many would show up, we upgraded the account to 500. So we had some costs incurred. Um, and if you feel like making a little donation or a gift um, to support our work, which is totally voluntary, and we do in our free time, um, that would be very highly appreciated. Um, I think you all received in the Eventbrite email also um, a little link where you can make that happen. Um, yes, let's go. Um, so what's going to happen today? Two things, essentially. Um, one thing is we're going to talk about donor economics, like what is donor economics, why is an interesting narrative um, and change framework, framework that has been applied to the city. That is, yeah, a little introduction that I'll be giving. Um, and then we're going to speak about this idea of ideal cities and um, how that has evolved over the history of urban design and, and how is that embedded into politics um, and of control of, um, yeah, health of, achieving certain ideals and morals in the city. And we will explore the link between these two worlds. Um, and since we don't know whether or not there's a connection and in what way there's a connection, um, we thought we framed this whole thing as sort of a collaborative research journey where we will also be asking you for your inputs and your insights and your ideas. Um, so the second section of the presentation will basically be crowdsourcing intelligence from you. Um, and then reflecting on that together. And then we'll also have some experts um, that will be yeah, sharing their view on what they've read from you and heard from us, and perhaps also add their little sort of um, sprinkle of expertise, yeah. And um, so, yeah, this is basically the idea, some input on donor economics and the history of uh, ideal city design. Then we have the co-research phase where you give input, 
where we have a snapshot of the results and the panel discussion. Um, yeah, who's who? Who's here today with us? So there's Sophia and I, Leon, and um, yeah, we sort of co-initiated this, this event because um, at the degrowth, the International Degrowth Conference in August, um, we hadn't met, but we were both attending apparently, <laughs> and there uh, a network called the Municipal Degrowth Network had emerged, which, um, and for the kickoff event for the, of the Municipal Degrowth Network, I was invited as a speaker to share my experience as a community organizer of Donut Berlin, which is sort of a grassroots-led participatory platform that tries to bring the principles that Donut Economics yeah, Donut Economics proposes into action. Um, and yeah, that was a very, very cool sort of kickoff. And then after that event, we figured that Sophia had all of this interesting knowledge about um, shapes and, you know, the way that they function, what, you know, how, how they've historically been used in specific ways by specific people for specific interests. And then we came up with the idea, let's merge that. Let's bring together some, some historians and experts and people that are interested in this sort of perspective and some people that are engaged in policy and donor activism. Um, and this is where we're at. So um, yeah, that's the two of us. And then there's also Luciana, who um, you can very well recognize by her lovely background, which she uh, also asked us to establish, but I think we either forgot or we, we kindly rejected to. Um, and yeah, Lucy is helping us with the moderation. It was also being very helpful with, um, yeah, organizing the event and setting up technicalities. Um, and then we have for the later panel discussion, we have two more um, guests whom we are very honored to have and very pleased to be here with us. Um, that is uh, Leonora um, from Donut Economics Action Lab. She's the um, lead of Donut Economics Action Lab. And um, <clears throat> so the perfect person to address these sort of thoughts. And she's also just shared with us that, um, yeah, these questions that we'll be tackling today have also sort of um, been on her agenda. So I hope that will be a mutually sort of beneficial conversation there. And then also Professor Simon Goldhill, um, who is Sophia's, I think, uh, former PhD supervisor at the first year. No, that is wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, Simon. Joke. Okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, we'll be saying just a couple of words about Simon later on, but then you know each other from Cambridge, so, so that's, that's, that's for sure. Um, so this is the crowd, but there's also many more people here, and that is you. Um, and so it took me a while to, <laughs> to do this word cloud in the shape of a donut uh, projected onto um, a very prominent image from the history of ideal cities. And uh, what we can see here is, yeah, that there's lots of people from research, policymakers, entrepreneurs, activists um, that showed up here today. So this is all you um, and much more than that, I assume. Um, yeah, but so welcoming you all again, it's a pleasure to have you. And um, yeah, again, the invitation to also use the space for yourselves to introduce, to make connections. Personally, my journey into the donor economics sphere was very much informed, um, yeah, by also networks and, and chatting with people in Zoom chats and then meeting up in Berlin and so on. So yeah, just an encouragement to do that here as well. So yeah, let us start. Donor economics, um, I send around the video before the event started. Um, some of you might have seen it, others haven't. So I'm gonna just run you real brief through the main ideas of Don Economics. So yeah, Don Economics is this compass that was um, developed by Kate Rayworth in um, an Oxfam paper that she'd written and then published it as a book. Uh, the idea here basically is, okay, we have a planetary budget of resources that we're not you know, supposed to surpass. So we have a, 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 yeah, a ceiling um, that we must organize societies and well-being within. And then we have also um, social rights, human rights that we want to meet. And um, so there is some sort of resource consumption necessary to meet these rights, um, but they shouldn't, and, and they should be sufficiently high um, to, to safeguard them. At the same time, they shouldn't surpass a specific limit. So we have that's the idea of donut economics. And it's sort of a mixture between um, sustainable development goals um, 
and planetary bound the planetary boundaries framework developed by um, the Resilient Institute in, in Stockholm. And yeah, that's the model. If we quantify the model for the globe, we see this image, which is basically the global donut selfie, which tells us, okay, there is a social shortfall and a planetary overshoot of nations. And that's a problem because at the present moment, we're not in a safe and just space for humanity to thrive for all within planetary boundaries. Um, now, what that has uh, brought cities into basically is this situation. We, we try to um, <clears throat> yeah, map, map the situation onto like a little cartoon. So basically, there's a huge donut <laughs> in front of cities and it's more than they can chew. So the global donut is quite a big challenge. And so the idea is we need to downscale the donuts in a way that it's manageable for cities. Um, however, there's lots of influences in that process and actors involved. So there's climate change really pressuring cities to do that quickly. Uh, there's people <laughs> who demand these changes. Um, Deal is sort of supervising and policing that in a way by trying to ensure integrity of the donut model and preventing it from greenwashing. And then in the background, there's also these historians who've been silent on this for a long time. And so we want to change that today together with you. Um, yeah. And one way to downscale this big donut to make it edible for cities essentially has been this idea of the um, city portrait methodology, which was co-created together with the Donut Economics Action Lab in the city of Amsterdam in an attempt to operationalize the donut for the local level, or for, for the municipal level. And the, um, the basic question that this um, methodology asks is this one. So it asks, how can our city become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? So here we see four highlighted aspects that translate into essentially, if you roll out the donuts um, into four quadrants. Um, so here you see, um, these four yeah this one big question is dissected or separated into four smaller questions um on the top you see um the question how can our city respect the health of the whole planet so basically the question of what can we do as a local place um to yeah to to thrive within our local habitat um oh no i'm sorry yeah, no, that's that's basically good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you also have that from a global perspective. So the ecological global lens would be asking how can our city respect the well being of all people? So that would be, for example, the supply chains of businesses um, all the way vertically down to the global south. What are the impacts that we can see there? Um, socially, um, we have also the local lens, which would be asking how can how, how can all the people of our city thrive? Um, in a way that we yeah we have a democratic well you know well-being culture that that everybody's sort of um supporting um and that enables everybody to participate and then you have the social global perspective where if you're asking okay how can our city be as gen okay i'm sorry <laughs> i think i messed up some some of the, the the text blurbs here but basically there's also a global a uh, global social perspective that be asking for the impact of the city along the value chain of, and human rights down, further down the sort of um further down the line um and this is essentially what we've been doing with don berlin like we've tried to ask these four questions and apply them to the city level and we did not really know what that meant and so what we did was to basically um yeah just play around with different interventions, formats, ideas. We organized a festival. We had a talk underneath a donut skeleton <laughs> in um, the Museum of Natural History in Berlin, including Kate. Uh, we spoke to businesses and uh, in what way um, they may create more circular solutions. And yeah, even had like uh, street festivals and retreats where we would figure out strategies for how to do that. But we're obviously not the only one. Um, everything basically started with the donuts in Amsterdam, which is this donut. And what followed was a whole array of uh, different places also trying to adapt the donut and downscale it to, into their very own local version. 
Um, so this is the Melbourne donut, which was part of a huge participatory process. Here you see uh, a Devon donut. Here you see a Brussels donut. Here you see um, a, a Maori donut, which is which was developed by a community in um, in New Zealand, where actually they turned around the local and the, the social lens, where the, the ecologicals in the middle and the socials outside, because they they deem the ecological to be so central that it must stand in the middle. Um, and then also, for example, here, our local Berlin version of the donut. Um, now, why is that becoming so popular? Why do cities do that? Um, and if you look at these different social economy policies and frameworks on the left, like the Green Deal, the SDGs, the economy for the common good, um, circular economy, heterodox economics, degrowth, and whatnot, um, the very strength, as you can see here, um, while they are all in some way more or less pluralistic, and so they try to account for well-being beyond GDP, while they're all in some way um, looking for redistributive justice and uh, ensuring human rights, while they're all in so some sort of sense um, addressing the question of ecological justice and considering actors that are more than human, um, and while they're yeah, some of them trying to politicize the growth questions by not just being agnostic about it. Um, and while they are also all in some way transformative because they address different levels of society, they are very complex to understand. <laughs> so the donut really, the strength as you can see here, is it's a simple narrative that people can follow. It's a circle with two rings. Um, it's a sexy, small, very um, playful image. Um, and, and this is why it's sort of um, yeah, caught the public attention. Now the specific, like, why is that? Yeah, obviously, because it's simple. What makes it simple? I think if you look at the principles proposed by Don Economics, um, there really is a move away from like complex mathematical sort of formularism that has been prominent economic thinking um, to uh, simple linear, uh, to simple spherical um, circular shapes. Like you see that changing the goal from 21st century economics GDP to how can we get into the donut? Seeing the big picture, like rethinking the market into an embedded economy. Um, yeah, getting away from um, yeah mechanical equilibria model to um, systems thinking. So also on the right here, you see again sort of this this visual narrative that that is very circular, um, and also the growth question, like you know, just some examples of of, of the ways in which circularity is embedded in the donut model and here also designing to regenerate um, so these are all um yeah very good examples of why we think um it's important to look at the visual language that a donor employs um and what makes the donor special and also why we think it's been quite uh yeah so successful and why it will be adopted much more in the future now, the question that we're having is actually, is the, val is the donut a value neutral sort of image, however, or because, you know, it has this idea of, okay, we all want to be safe and within planetary boundaries. So it's a good goal we can all agree on. Um, and and it, it has this post ideological sort of, you know, um, touch to it. It has this, you know, uh, neutrality to it. Um, but is the, the donut actually so neutral? Um, or are there some blind spots that we need to explore um, that haven't been explored so far by contextualizing and historicizing the donuts? And this is sort of what, um, yeah, Sophia is now going to fill you in on. Thank you. <laughs> hello, hello, nice to see everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you now. Hopefully, can everybody see that? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, so when I saw the donut, it really struck me because um, when it becomes representative of a city, it actually taps into a long history of thinking about and representing urban planning ideals. And today I'm presenting a small selection of these schemes, uh, which have asked their own variations on the donut questions. So how can we plan a healthy city adapted to its environment and for human prosperity, for example? Previous authors also came up with abstract circular diagrams and linked them up to policy solutions which were implemented across the globe as governments copied and competed with each other. 
Like the donor, these schemes didn't necessarily translate into circular layouts, but we do have some of these. So though this tradition is extremely familiar to historians of urbanism, it seems important to flag it up now in the context of deal uh, donor economics, because uh, deal have called for a greater focus on the role and impact of history, power relations, and legacies of colonialism. We are so, friend, Rara. Today, I hope to introduce <laughs> further context. Could you please mute yourself? Um, thank you. Today, I hope to introduce further context in these regards and so to provide a touchstone for a discussion of the donut as a concept. In terms of my methodology, I really want to flag up some limits to what I'm saying today. Uh, first, I'm not constructing any genealogy or lineage for the donut. As you can see here, circles and circular cities appear across lots of different cultures and times and represent different values, knowledges and belief systems. They have taken both abstract and material form. So you can see two abstract examples are the Buen Vivir and the Buddhist Dharma wheel. And as was the settlements of Dashli, Baghdad and Firuzabad, we do also have circular layouts, which have been tributes to geometry, social structure, astrology and the cosmos. The idea that a city on earth could reflect the laws of the universe and the heavens. I'm telling quite a pointed story about a small selection of examples, which will allow me to highlight first and most obviously that there is a Western tradition of thinking about how an ideal city should be built, which has long pursued goals such as justice and health and proposed abstract circular solutions. By choosing a set of examples influenced by each other's legacies, I can highlight some common themes, best intentions and problematic logics. And this might also help us to think about the possible legacy of the donor and the broader conceptualization of models for post growth cities. So we should really place the donor into the context of these examples, because it would seem that we are living in a moment of circularity with our own belief systems and day to day behavior increasingly organized around this symbol. The circle is everywhere on packaging and branding. It's used to represent a variety of philosophical, ethical and economic statements, freshly symbolic, I think, of order and morality. To take an example, the circular economy comes with its own mantras, prosperity for all, the goods of today are the resources of tomorrow, recycle, remanufacture, reduce and reuse. Comparatively, proponents of degrowth adopt the spiral and the snail shell to caution against the problems of excessive growth. And our post-growth innovation lab also has a spiral because it indicates a type of constant innovation within parameters rather than in pursuit of growth. In each of these cases, the circle represents a new vision of progress, the pursuit of excellence and virtue. And the donut sits amongst these examples with its own metrics, it too appeals to the idea, I think, that the circle is morally good. This idea that perfection and morality can be thought about in circular ways has been a really crucial and powerful idea within the history of Western urban design. And there is a tradition of thinkers who have theorized how to build an ideal city, by which I mean a city which embodies the values and principles they deemed ideal in their context. Does the donut fit into this tradition? Um, I'm not providing any answers here, and I'm sure that many of you have knowledge about other historic traditions too. So the purpose is for us all to have an open discussion at the end. At the end of our discussion, hopefully we will have a better understanding of whether this history of ideas is useful for thinking about our present action. So Leon and I thought that it would be good to keep these questions in mind during the presentation, which we will come back to in the Mentimeter. Um, when the donut is downscaled to a city scale, does it become an ideal city? In what ways is it different? Can this historic context help us to clarify the pitfalls and presumptions the donut should avoid? Can the history of ideal city design help us to understand why its visual narrative has been received so well? And can you think of any examples, like what comes into your head when you look at the donut? Are there examples of practices in your context, um, if the donut's being used as a tool, which kind of fits with this tradition or pushes against it? Great, so looking forward to discussing in about half an hour. Um, I want to start with a text or what we could consider a sort of methodology for building an ideal city. Ancient Greek and Roman authors thought a lot about how an ideal city should be built and organized because cities were essential to their culture. They were a means to transmit values and ways of life much as they are now. As a result, we have many writings on this subject from antiquity, and one of these texts, the De Architectura, or on architecture, written by a Roman author, Vitruvius, is the only surviving architectural treatise. 
Vitruvius was writing in a context of cultural change in a moment of urbanization and an emerging imperial ideology consolidated through city building. And here he theorized how to build an ideal city. So he wrote about layout, building types um, and functions. The text is also an exploration of philosophical ideals, medicine, history, law, and economics. We could compare it to the donut methodology for the city portrait in these uh, respects. The ideas contained within this text have been key to architectural and engineering practice over centuries in many parts of the globe. And there are three key ideas I'm going to pull out today. First, Vitruvius argued that an ideal city should be healthy and to be healthy, it needed to adapt to the natural environment. As he argued, a healthy city could provide for the human body and its needs, good air, good water, food and light, for example. To meet these needs, it was essential for the built environment to be tailored to the body and the natural environment. This meant that each city had to be built differently according to context by assessing and responding to the local conditions to manage the challenges a site presented, one being bad air, for example. The guiding principles for good health and good building practice were the same across the board. Vitruvius made his arguments by drawing parallels from the natural world. He argued, for example, that if animals could suffer and die, from the one or superabundance of any one element not suitable to their temperament, it also made sense to choose a suitable site for man's body. So one had to observe his surroundings and circumspection, as he said, should be used in the choice of a healthy site for a city. Failing to do this, the environment will be built badly and it could make you sick. So the first point I'd like to draw out is that human needs are thought of medically and could be provided by attaining the proper relationship between the environment and the city as a being. Of course, Vitruvius understood this relationship according to a medical understanding completely different to our own. He believed, for example, that hot climates changed the body, making men more resistant to fevers, but less fierce in battle. But the logic is comparable. To make the best environment for urban inhabitants, you could learn what to do by observing and responding to nature. Second, an ideal city should embody a set of ideals, some of which you can see listed there on the right. For Vitruvius, the essential principles were strength, utility, and beauty, which we might compare to the sustainable development goals of inclusivity, safety, resilience, and sustainability, for example. As ideals, beauty, strength, and utility are clearly open to interpretation. They can be understood in diverse ways and different contexts, but Vitruvius again took his argument from nature. As you can read here, he argued that nature had produced man and given man a symmetrical body, Perfect buildings should reflect nature's order, hence perfect buildings should also be symmetrical. So the argument therefore that man and his environment should be in harmony with nature, but the assumption that man and his body were nature. So man provided a starting point and organizing principle for a harmonious city, an anthropocentric vision. The body itself provided the measurements for the built environment, so in feet, hands and palms, for example. Design itself was up to a professional figure, the architect, and here we can find some principles we might agree with, economy and morality. So to be economic, he advocated a type of localism. An architect should build according to what his context offered to avoid the use of materials which are not easily procured and prepared on the spot, um, because these might be, um, it might involve great trouble and great expense. In terms of morality and justice, these were realized through practice and were the architect's duty. He should be philosophically educated. So moral philosophy would teach the architect to be above meanness in his dealings, making him just, client, compliant and faithful. Um, it would prevent greed from gaining an ascendancy over him. And so his thoughts would be um, about things that weren't necessarily for professional gain um, and profit. So in such passages, we can see that an ideal city, one built to fulfill ideals of strength, justice, morality, and harmony with nature actually requires an ideal type of planner, a polymath with integrity. He had to be an expert and to abide by moral standards. These ideas might seem excellent, but the implication was that other ways of building were not ideal and could not embody true justice, morality, etc. This text is full of prejudices, one of which is a lin linear conception of good practice. Um, as Vitruvius argued, originally men had built huts, as you can see on the left, and then progressed towards a sort of complex type of city building practice by the Romans with, with Roman building types, which was advanced, developed and civilized. 
hence types of building which did not match up to ideal standards imposed by such, such a methodology could be termed primitive and barbarian. The logic being that urbanization should develop them towards this advanced model. And this is the danger with defining ideal when um, there are colonial logics underpinning urbanization. These are the ideas which generally run through ideal city schemes. The, um, the idea that the city should achieve an ideal relationship between man and the natural environment, that it should be built to embody a set of ideals, that it is justified by a knowledge claim as to whom has the expertise to execute this vision, which is generally underpinned by colonial assumptions. So where do circles come into this kind of thinking? For this, we need to think about the later impact of Vitruvius's text. Though it's generally argued that his treatise did not result in the implementation of ideal city schemes in its time, the concept did have a great impact for centuries afterwards. And in this next section, I'm going to talk about some key moments and its legacy, moments when Vitruvius's teachings were upheld, interpreted, innovated, and applied. In this way, we can start to think about the possible problems with producing an idea for a city type and what logics can be legitimized by the best intentions. So Vitruvius did not clearly explain the kinds of layout and infrastructures a city required as a one layout. As a result, this had, um, there's been great debate amongst his readers. They debated how best to plan a healthy city, how to define beauty and harmony, and how to connect these principles to material form. And this process ran through the medieval period and includes Christian interpretations, but today I'm going to focus on some Renaissance examples. During the Renaissance, texts like this formed the backbone of education and were taken to be culturally authoritative. And here are two examples of Renaissance reinterpretations of the text that we just read together. The principle that a city should perfectly reflect nature's order and then for the proportions of the human body is visualized by putting man at the center of everything. In the words of Leonardo da Vinci, man is the model of the world at the center of the circle. Hence, this image connects nature, harmony, circles, and human forms as concepts together. This process of reinterpretation did also translate into a rich array of architectural building feeds. These were presented as innovations of an existing idea because they carried the same principles forwards like health, beauty, strength, and utility. Even if the process of adaptation integrated new knowledges such as medical understandings, and new building technologies and layouts, which took actual practice further from the methodology Vitruvius had theorized. For example, there are no radial cities in Greco-Roman antiquity and Vitruvius did not teach that you should build one, but Renaissance readers claiming to truly understand his text built new radial cities and termed them expressions of the ideal city and Palmanova is one example. So why is this important? Because new policy, new ideas and new building plans were legitimized by the pursuit of ideal standards considered authoritative in that context. And they were also legitimized by a theoretical foundation, which was authoritative. And this led to the replanning of cities and construction of new ones, according to the logics of whomever could wield this knowledge and define what was ideal. Um, let's take a look at Palmanova, the example on the right. Palmanova can illustrate for us how top-down conceptions of a harmonious environment for human prosperity might translate into an extremely controlled and inflexible environment. This approach presents a rigid geometric arrangement where space is a technology used to instate an understanding of moral values like beauty and goodness, and therefore to dictate good behavior. Walking occurs to get from A to B and the neatness of the arrangement invites neither experimentation nor spontaneity. Indeed, um, throughout history, they populated the city with criminals because nobody wanted to live there and prisoners of war because they could be observed from every angle. The claim that this type of knowledge about how to build an ideal city was authoritative and superior to other types informed later planning choices throughout history. It established pathways in moments of rebuilding, revolution, natural crisis and epidemics. Here are three European examples of radial uh, layouts. London on the left after the fire, Paris after the famous rebuilding by Haussmann, and the less famous rebuilding of Naples on the right, which copied the Parisian example. I'm showing you these to illustrate that in moments of rebuilding, governments have competed to demonstrate their good governance by providing for essential needs, which they link to acquiring certain technologies and certain layouts. 
This ultimately made certain technologies into symbols of urban health, beauty, justice, order, and improvement, which generated expectations for development. Key to note, therefore, is when linking up technologies to the idea of a thriving city, to beauty, harmony, etc., you have to think about the technological pathways, the forms of symbolic competition they create, and the possibilities which they establish. These choices impact upon other forms of being and practices, other ways of living. And I want to draw out this point about technology and control a bit more by talking about one 19th century scheme. As many have raised during the pandemic, the 19th century is relevant to us at the present moment because there was a major rethinking of how to build, how to imagine and how to behave in a city as a response to pollution and a new knowledge of disease. So this produced visual imaginings and stories about the city, which helped to motivate big changes like new water systems. And that's something you can see there on the left is how Thames River water was imagined to be a monster soup full of microbes. Planners produced schemes to meet what they considered essential needs according to the planning ideals which were appropriate to their own context. Made important by demographic and technological changes, safety, employment, liberty and social equity, for example. I'm going to talk about one of these, Ebenezer's uh, Howard's Garden City, as my last example today because it keeps being referenced as a model for change. For example, it came up in the Daring Cities Conference and is generally seen as a sort of green um, model. Howard proposed his ideal city scheme through a series of conceptual diagrams, and this is the first of them, the magnet diagram. He argued that an ideal city should be produced by marrying town and country to produce an offspring, a new civilization from their best attractive characteristics. A city should therefore have all the advantages of the town, social opportunity, places for amusement, chances of employment, but without the foul air, um, high rents, how it's associated to the city. And it should have the advantages of the country, beauty of nature, abundance of water and forest without the lack of public spirit, lack of society and unemployment, which how it associated to the country. Yeah. The people are imagined to exist at the center of the diagram, sitting in this empty circular space between the magnets. Howard's vision of harmony is explained further in a second diagram, this circle on the right. It presents a settlement for around 30,000 inhabitants where people live in justice and harmony, as you can see a circle there on the right and left. If this circle looks good and relatable, you have to investigate the broader values which underpinned its vision. And answers lie again in the medical definition of thriving, which for schemes, yeah, like how was it was medical and moral? Such schemes were drawn up against the background of a powerful public health movement, which collected data about space and its inhabitants. Data deemed necessary to diagnose alleged problem factors in society which needed to be fixed. Generally, these problem factors were certain people because they suffered more from disease, certain spaces where they were found, and certain practices which were deemed immoral or unhygienic. And spatial planning was applied as a tool to remove these so-called impurities in order to engineer a better, healthier society. That would be the offspring of Howard's Garden City marriage. Certainly this process has beneficial impacts such as the Public Health Act, but it also gave power to medics in such a way that infrastructural decisions were legitimized by statistics rather than through communication with the people in favor of a very controlled technocratic vision of what made for a good society. Hence the number of inhabitants were capped, the inhabitants were zoned, space had to be ordered by function and outcomes could not be messy or uncertain. Harmony could only be kept if the characteristics of town and country remained ideal, which required the number needs, even activities of inhabitants to generally remain ideal. And Howard's scheme may look green, but it was part of a broader picture and economic system which aimed overall at growth, within which there were no planetary boundaries. So garden cities grew and they filled with white collar workers. Of course, this is one key facet of the Garden City. And if you want to get a broader um, interpretation of the scheme, please see the article linked at the bottom of the diagram. There are some echoes, I would argue, of this approach in the smart city concept, bringing this um, closer to present day. Again, this is presented as a holistic circle. It too seeks to map and understand the city as a whole and uses data and technology to cultivate better relationships between citizens and the government. Hence, the goodness of a city and the goodness of its citizens is represented by technologies, 
which are presented as solutions for ideals like health and morality. Whether these are, you know, radial layouts, aqueducts or electric helicopters, for example. Visions of the thriving city need to be aware that technologies come with a symbolic baggage and are not equivalent to morality. Historically, these types of technocratic dynamics have been established by the exportation of ideal city schemes to other contexts. Schemes like Howard's were produced by an imperial mindset informed by the logics we read earlier in Vitruvius's methodology. Planners performed sanitary crusades, preaching a vision of beauty, utility, and health abroad to these places they deemed in need. And you're just looking at um, an advert that I found in an um, architectural periodical there from 1904. You can tell this story about lots of cities in this period and after, so perhaps you know some that we can discuss uh, later, but let's take New Delhi as an example now. When New Delhi was built by the British to make it their colonial capital, they exported um, the garden city concept there, the one that we just saw with the green circle, and linked it up to certain infrastructures and architectural types. Such adaptations of ideal city concepts caution that when ideas about what is good is imposed upon other cultures, this shapes ways of life and future trajectories. These building initiatives acted as an expression of British culture and values. They materialized power dynamics, which were long lasting. Moving into the final two minutes of my presentation, um, I want to end uh, by linking up 19th century approaches with the present day with a comment on uh, the rhetoric, which is accompanying the kind of Donut City and circularity narrative. So as we've heard, 19th century planners used medical language and mapped cities medically because if you diagnose a city, there is a possibility of curing it. The donut methodology performs a different kind of mapping and monitoring exercise, which also taps into this tradition of medical diagnosis. And there's a degree of um, rhetorical overlap, right, in which the economy is allegorized organically. So we have inherited economic degeneration. It's faulty characteristics. We must move from economies that are degenerative to those which are regenerative by design. And there are also diagnostic phases. So Mohat Gupta speaking about the application of donut principles in India, for example, described how we use the exercise to identify our city's pain points using a set of measurements, indicators and statistics which are mapped directly onto um, the diagram which provides a way of relating to the city as a being and as a kind of body. So the city portrait or selfie, we could say, actually offers an allegory for the body politic, its governance and its well-being, according to what it is eating and its consumption. Perhaps we can understand this more fully because historically the circle has been synonymous with goodness, uh, cleanliness and purity. For this reason, its distortion carries a kind of moral dimension. Excessive consumption produces hazardous waste, matter which has gone beyond the proper boundary and so is out of place. It's monstrous like a disfigurement. This is an Im immoral representation of the city, something it's forced to face. Hence, the city portrait asks the city to look in the mirror and acknowledge its ailments. Some reactions describe the horror of this revelation. Understanding that this link between the circular and the messy has been key to the history of urban planning and has served to promote change helps to contextualize, I think, why the donut circle works so well to mobilize moral concerns to take action and to create a safe and just space. But by way of conclusion, uh, to round the many things I've said today, you could consider for the donut compass at an urban scale to do the same as the circular diagrams before it because it fits into this tradition of imagining the ideal city in circular ways, its guiding principles, how they can be implemented, arranged, organized, and whose responsibility it is to implement change. It adopts the kind of morals which ideal city schemes have historically pursued like justice and cleanliness and redefines them by adding its own set of metrics which have previously not been centered in ideal city thinking, you know, like gender equality, digital connectivity and biodiversity loss. So we could say that these make it a 21st century expression of our ideal culture. It is a 21st century ideal city. And yet it would seem that in practice, the donut consciously pushes against the ideal city tradition because it proposes a different value set for planning, emphasizing creativity, collaboration, communication between professions, community participation, experimental co-creation, which gives a greater number of people a political voice. 
Information is made open access, asking everyone to adapt and participate. So if the circle symbolizes all of this, perhaps it also stands in as a symbol for a new kind of planning. Equally, the circle undoubtedly represents an ideal kind of planning, which sets a very high bar for cities to pursue, something which this diagram from Andrew Fanning's article makes extremely clear. So you can see the ideal consumption on the top left and the reality surrounding it on the right, and that's at the level of nations. Historically, this tension has been problematic because the pursuit of an ideal, like the Donut City, has legitimized planning practices. And as the legacy of Vitruvius text has shown us today, when there is a degree of flexibility with these ideals, this allows for a long-term process of invention, innovation, and experimentation in many different locations. There is the danger, however, that this process of innovation will be legitimized by a label while enabling top-down and technocratic definitions of what it means to thrive. If you're setting this in the context of post-growth and degrowth debates, it's really important, therefore, to keep the plurality of what thriving means, particularly in terms of the technologies which are linked up to this ideal. It seems useful, therefore, to look at donut cities within this context for conceptual reasons. History would suggest that we should not speak of the donut city because that would cast it as an ideal city and no such thing exists. It also seems important to use a plural label donut cities with caution because these are attempts to strive towards this ideal rather than expressions of it. So when I was thinking about this, I just thought that it was important to dissociate circularity, wholeness, this ideal shape from the city and to think of it more like a Kandinsky painting. Um, perhaps we should not speak of donut cities at all. Maybe this is all wrong. Um, and this is a tension that we can explore together now, hopefully in the discussion, because I don't have any answers, we don't have any answers, um, and we'd love to hear from everyone in the room about what you think. Thank you. Um, virtual applause for you, Sophia. Thanks a lot. That was a lot. Um, I saw that there were some comments and some questions in, in, in the chat. Um, yeah, let's, let's pick up on what has been posted already. And I have to now do several things at the same time, <laughs> letting people in. Yeah, we, we said we would allow for um, some questions now, but also we had planned for a broader participation from the audience in, with questions in the end. Um, so to pick up on what I uh, saved, um, Subin asked, how is this framework being implemented in practice in places like Amsterdam? Um, yeah, where it has been developed in partnership with policymakers. Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if like this is a very broad question. It's not so much on what uh, Sophia mentioned or Sophia uh, uh, presented. Um, that we could skip perhaps, and then we could invite some people from Amsterdam who perhaps is there to also discuss. Much of this thinking seems to be replacing existing past models with the donut economy model. However, is it more realistic to think about the outcome of a blending of traditional and donut economic thinking, action, reaction, and then synthesis? Perhaps you could comment on that, Sophia. Apologies, I went into a complete brain fog. <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> yeah, Scott mentioned that. Um, I think you 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 had that in the end also, but just to to um, highlight his his thinking here, um, much of this thinking seems to be replacing existing past models uh, with the donut economic model. However, isn't it more realistic to think about the outcome? of a blending of traditional and donut economic thinking, action, reaction, and then synthesis? Um, I'm not sure that I'm the best person to answer this question. Um, what you're saying does seem to make a lot of sense. Um, I'm not sure if Leonardo would like to comment on that. I'd, I'd rather we hear from everybody in the kind of crowdsource uh, exercise and, and, and then we can come back to this because it's yes. a question that's really asking us about what's the way forward. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good, a good. Uh, there is another question that just appeared. Have there been other urban cycle models in, the, in other parts of the world? Is this something we can perhaps answer directly? 
I mean, urban circle model. Do you mean circular models? Cycle models? Um, the past models, I perhaps, uh, yeah. Where's that question, sorry? It's Who's from it? Eva from um, Mexico, I think. Eva Valencia from Mexico. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to find it. Well, so the question is about whether there are sec other circular examples. Are circle models, I think, like in the history. Yeah, history. Um, yes, uh, there have been many. Uh, I've given you a selection from a, a tradition that's based in Greco-Roman thinking uh, that I've mm -hmm. wrote my PhD about. And uh, there are many circular cities from other time periods. Mm -hmm. if, if you want more information on that, um, I can send it to you because I can't list your bibliography right now. Yeah, um, yeah Sophia, I, I think there will be a, a great interest on your uh, source of <laughs> bibliography. There were some people asking about this also already on the example from Delhi. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. but... Um, the most obvious example is uh, Jerusalem as the center of the world, as the circle of uh, the temple in the middle and the city of the circle and the world as the circle around Jerusalem. It's incredibly important for the whole of Western thinking about the way the universe is organized and the way uh, cities in particular are central to that. Thanks, Simon. Great. Um, let me just check, I think. Um... Um, there were some good good uh, summaries, like lovely description of the shift from value of uh, relationship life to fear, protection, safety. I think that uh, uh, resonates. Uh, fear and security also were key to medieval cities that develop inside and around more or less around castle walls. Yeah, so I think um, there is um, some, um, some good uh, like comments on this in the chat. We can uh, come to, to a further discussion with you just uh, in, in a bit, but before that, as we promised, we want to tap in the, in the um, collective intelligence that is here. And I think for that, uh, Leon, I pass over to you, right? Yes, thank you so much. Also, as regards like the Amsterdam question, I know we have Martin here, um, who is an expert on that because he's doing research on the ways um, Amsterdam is implementing the donut. Has some very interesting insights on that. I think we will add you or at least your comment on that to the panel later on. Um, and as of now, um, it would be really, really cool if you all would, um, yeah, share your thoughts with us as well. <laughs> now that you've heard a lot of information from us. Um, so Menti is um, a digital participation tool. Um, we've set up four questions for you, um, including lots of very cool art from Eric Joyner, um, which you will only be able to see and unlock <laughs> as you click through the questions <laughs> and progress in the survey. Um, so yeah. This is the way to go. In the chat, you see also a direct link to um, the questionnaire. So there's three ways you can access, either through the link or through the QR code or by just going on menti.com and typing in the code. Um, we really, really appreciate your input. It's very, very important um, for us also to sort of check back the hypothesis we've just set up and the, the thoughts we've had up. Um, with a crowd of both lay interested people as well as experts. Um, yeah, both to sharpen my own understanding, but also to um, yeah, produce good science and uh, write a proper paper, <laughs> uh, which is also part of the outcome that will be um, flowing from this entire session. Um, and most likely be presented in June <laughs> in Italy at the conference on ecological economics. Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions, please type in the chat, um, but I hope this should be self-explanatory. So, oh, great. Oh, great. Um, Leon, I see already like 23 people uh, started uh, putting in their answers. Uh, we give you now some silence time to work, and also if you need just to also stretch or stand up a bit, uh, feel free to self-care for yourself. Five minutes, right? Yeah. yeah, let's make it seven. 
Seven? Um, good. Seven sounds good, yeah. And Eric Joyner's art is really cool. Like he always links cities with donuts and robots, where the donuts are sort of flying around and are the opponents of the robots that are taking over the cities. Whatever your own interpretation of that is, I thought could be yeah, maybe a good theme to for our event today. Um, yeah, see you in five minutes. Ago. What was that? Does he ever get to the top? Who? The, the robots? The donut stuff. <laughs> yeah. To the Buddha. Yeah, well, that's also quite yeah, a cool. <laughs> Yeah, set a high bar. Donut setting high bars, I think.
All right. Thank you so, so, so much for taking the time. Um, Sophia and I are now really quickly, like in a, in a let's put it, let's say seven minute snapshot, uh, run you all through the responses and also our panelists through the, respon through the responses that we've received on the four questions. Um, so yeah, what do we see here? That was a simple yes or no question, an easy starter. Um, is the donut an ideal city? It depends. <laughs> Lots of social scientists in the room. <laughs> That's always the answer, I guess, that you get given an essay. Perfect. And always correct. Um, so it'll be nice to explore the depends, the different depends you think are worthwhile exploring um, in the uh, following questions and then seeing them and read your responses. Um, not having an idea is totally okay. I think this is a very complex question that re requires a lot of background knowledge. <laughs> so no shame in that. Um, no, and yes, so yeah, but basically most people think it depends. And I think that that's also my gist of your presentation, Sophia, what, what's your thought on that? I would love to hear from the people that said yes, why they, what made them categorize it as such. I don't know if they can write in the chat. Um, because yeah, I think my general feeling is that it totally depends on how you implement, how you link it to policies and stuff. And obviously there's so many different cities doing it that it's not like there's one way of doing, so you can't say it is or it isn't def def definitively, yeah. Um, oh yeah, I'm sorry to hear also that the Mentimeter had a technical problem for some. Um, since nobody's writing in the chat um, why they think, yes, the donut is an ideal city, perhaps somebody wants to speak up, I don't know, perhaps that, that comes easier. Okay, that's okay. awesome. <laughs> I don't mind saying why yes. I'll say yes. Oh, yes no. Okay, so you are most of this. Well, any model that presupposes, however ludic, that there's one model for cities is bound to be idealized, if nothing else. So, you know, the difficulty about the question is: is the donut an ideal city? Well, the donut's not a city. <laughs> the donut's a donut. But it is it um, <laughs> is it an idealized city? Well, the moment in which you go, there's only one sort of city that we need to think about. You know, the cities of the global south, the major cities, small cities, cities of more than 10 million, citizens of 300,000, yeah, I don't know. So I think oh, if you have one model, you have a problem. And that's all I would say. And that's, uh, you know, it's, it's inbuilt into, this, into the thinking about the word city. It's not a problem for donuts alone. And donut does better than others, but it's still idealized. Mm. Mm. I unfortunately missed all of that because my internet fell. <laughs> oh, don't worry, it was brilliant. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, Thank you, yeah. Simon, for sharing. Um, let's go to the next question, I guess, um, and scroll through the answers that you gave, if Menti allows me to. Um, Sophia, do you want to take the lead on this one? I can scroll. Okay. Where do you see similarities and differences between the donut and over cities? Please elaborate. Similar in its moral and normative nature, different in that donut has no prescriptive design and architectural aspects. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. It's not, what, but what we are seeing surely is that as time goes on, it, these kind of design and architectural aspects are going to emerge because as I was kind of trying to make the point that they'll get linked up to different policies and infrastructures. Um, one would assume based on the past. Um, participatory democracy, ecological focus with economy inside, nature and community thriving above economic growth. Yeah, it definitely has a different set of um, ideals uh, and ways of planning to those that have come before it. Um, but again, they, they are perfect situation, but um, I don't know as much about Donut as the past. Um, donut cities realize the limitations that prevent them from being ideal cities by recognizing responsibilities towards others. Yeah, I think this is the biggest difference in when I was reading the methodology in that it's so much about 
the responsibility between people on the planet and the responsibility that um, between the people that are implementing change and, and the citizens themselves through participatory planning rather than top-down squash. But maybe this is a good, um, actually we'll bring, I'd like to talk to Martin in the next um, question. Um, I can't scroll down anymore. Could you scroll? Uh, resume scroll. Shortcut enter. Should be scrolling. But it's not uh, scrolling. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, both are arbitrary proposals for the humans on Earth to live. I would like to, someone to be, unpack that a bit more. Um, perhaps we could take this. What do you mean by arbitrary proposal? Um, if if someone would like to comment on the chat. Oh, uh, someone... Stan has his hand raised. Uh, Stan. Yeah, Stan. Well, I, you know, my comment's actually on the right there, but it's the arbitrariness of the donut. I think the cool part of the donut is we have global boundary conditions scaling down to the home, the inner and outer rings. And so picking the donut as a city, I mean, a city is a logical downscaling of the globe, but in China, they have 20 mega cities and they actually have five types of cities as clusters of cities. Uh, Beijing is a circular city, so it's an old tradition, but it's a hierarchy of donuts. And so I think that's a real important concept. Uh, cities are different size and, uh, you know, scaling a, a big city, Tokyo, down into villages is the way it was designed and rebuilt a hundred times, probably. Um, and then down, you know, in a community scale, Dunbar suggests it keeps on clustering, right? The list, mm -hmm. the uh, the power law of how cities are scaled mm -hmm. is a really good downscaling model. So I like it as the power of a donut, but I think the donut is not the right way to think about it. I think the donut nesting, when she did the downscaling biomimicry thing, I think that was one of the coolest things. And so don't, don't lock in too much on the history of a certain size Western city. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very arbitrary because it is meant for everyone on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, Simon, I can't see you anymore, but I am assuming you're still there. Um, do you, hello. Do you think that, you know, after your work um, and in the Middle East that this kind of concept could be applied in planning to other contexts outside of, you know, um, you. Yes, uh, is the simple answer, it would help. Uh, after all, the Islamic city has a very long history of thinking of itself in, in media, in terms of radio uh, construction. And that, you know, that raises a particular point about the donut as a metaphor that, um, you have to decide if you're going to have a jam in the middle or a hole in the middle. And uh, the difficulty about a lot of cities uh, in their construction at the moment is that they have a hole in the middle rather than a jam. That's to say they have an empty space that is used for business and uh, it becomes empty at night and it's often really very poorly constructed as a center. Whereas the logic of the, the radial city in the old Islamic form is precisely that the center is where you put real shared facilities that are needed to be done so that you have to move through the city. You can't stay in your village on the edge. You have to come into the middle and you have to keep coming in, which is also an ancient Greek idea after all that the Astu in the middle is part of the polis, the, the center is part of the whole organization. And that you uh, articulate that space through ritual, through processes, through procession, and through other forms of, uh, of shared behavior. And I think if you're gonna think about the donut as an actual, city space as you did very, very productively. It seems to me you have to think really hard about what you put in the middle and how you articulate the spaces between the middle and the outside. If you can do that, you can construct a really strong and positive model. And it seems to me that it becomes also um, de facto a way of sharing. It's about moving through other people's spaces to a shared space. 
so that you can't maintain simply your own boundaries. And one of the hardest things in city planning is to think about the boundaries between communities and how those are maintained or crossed and what forms those take. So I think it, it's a, a useful metaphor and a useful uh, ground plan uh, in that way. So, yeah. Thank you. Great. I, I'm loving that we are just uh, already doing a kind of a panel discussion and bringing in the special guests here as well to Sorry. bring in the ideas. No problem. I think it's easy to do like this because uh, it's it's fresh and then they are all reading the um, the answers. Uh, just wondering if um, Leonora also wants to comment on something already. Otherwise, we can move on, Leonora. Up to you. Um, I am just really uh, enjoying everybody's uh, comments that are coming up. And I just want to share that for us at Donut Economic Section Lab, this is a, a very live and ongoing question that doesn't actually, we, I think we're all recognizing doesn't have a clear answer. And this is maybe one of the clear differences between the ideal city, historical ideal city tendencies and where we are today as um, you know, whatever we are, policymakers, researchers, planners, uh, architects, we, I think, are a lot more conscious of the flaws of setting uh, one-fit-all ideal city models uh, and are a lot more conscious that we should be focusing on process as much as on outcome, whereas historical ideal city models were very much outcome uh, focused and shape focused. Um, so in, in, in my perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, like, reading all the questions of what is the differences between ideal city and, and donut models. I think every single thing that I read uh, uh, resonated with me and because I think everybody's bringing their own uh, very grounded uh, experience. And I think in its, um, there are, and there are many reasons why there's a big difference in my view between ideal cities and donut cities. And one, one is what, what Sophia ended on. Uh, it's an internal discussion we've been having a lot and where we've landed on is we, we shouldn't really be using the phrase donut city because that, that is speaking to that uh, ideal city paradigm. Um, and we're recognizing that it's one, no, no city is there to we don't know if any city will be there. Three, we haven't firmly defined what that is. We are talking about cities living in the donut. And when we say that, we're talking about cities that are uh, you know, meeting the needs of all people uh, within the means of the planet locally and globally. And we are talking about developing a set of metrics to, to demonstrate it, but those metrics aren't firm. There aren't prescriptive lists, there are fluid, they are based on data that is different for every city and that is changeable and flexible and that will cannot really be firmly designed. Never can, we cannot right now reach that definition of what fully living in the donut means. I think it's a process that we need to keep on learning. But we are at a very different place than where people were historically because we have so much more understanding, so much more science, whether it's planetary boundaries, whether it's the pitfalls and, and kind of the failures of previous ideal models, whether it's understanding uh, uh, the role of so social justice and the role of uh, all people in, in, in planning and co-designing cities versus the very technocratic tendencies of most ideal uh, cities historically. So um, yes, I think it's an ongoing, very live learning exercise and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be, uh, to be learning from so many today. Thanks a lot, Leonora. Um, I think um, it resonates to also what's being commented also in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure, Leon, you also perhaps have a stake to say uh, something that comes to your mind when reading the, the answers. Let's make it some, some live discussion here. And I would also invite uh, everyone uh, to perhaps, if they want to uh, bring in some more detailed explanation of whatever, whatever you wrote, uh, please also feel free to raise your hand and we can engage in the discussion also with you. <laughs> Just like that people associate the donut with Homer Simpson. Yeah, I like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting um, that in the chat, 
I didn't like see this here so much in the, in the responses, but in the chats, a lot of the talk was about the, seeing the donut as a process and like not speaking about the donut as a noun, but as a verb, like I would assume that means donatizing cities or, you know, like implying that, yeah, the ideal of the donut is always in flow and is always sort of by definition, like a river, you know, by definition is always in flow. The donut wouldn't be a donut if it wasn't in flow. But the thing is I see in practice, most people see the donut as this sort of accounting tool, you know, where you can assess the metabolism of the city through this um, accounting regime with all of these numbers. And, you know, also with the medical language, Kate Rayworth herself, I mean, really, uses that image also you know of earth system science being a very not young science 25 plus year old and always comparing it to the history of medicine and the body and how we don't know much about uh, like how it took us hundreds of years to cure you know diseases or to find vaccines for specific diseases and how that you know took a lot of understanding of how the body works and how in comparison to these 300 years of medical history sort of the dawn of like earth system science and planetary boundary science is very young so there is definitely that rhetoric or thing also that Sophia mentioned um and in practice it's it's being yeah like I, I, we've also been approached a lot by businesses in cities and by huge pension funds that really just want to use the dawn as sort of as of image and as an accounting framework to visualize how great and green and whatnot their, their financial investments are, for example, or how great the city does in all of these dimensions. So it is being used quite statically and technocratically. And at this point, I think it would be really interesting to hear from Martin, who's been researching how the practice um, of implementing the donuts as a process has played out in Amsterdam because I know that his research also points to some critical perspectives um, that may not actually hold up that I or that image that um, there's no technocratic, you know, expertise culture involved, um, and that there may be quite a top-down implementation going on in Amsterdam. Um, Martin, I asked in the chat previously if you would um, be open to jump in on that question are you still with us i'm here don't um i'm, I'm here <laughs> great uh yeah i can definitely jump in i'm also wondering is anybody else um working at the amsterdam municipality or researching on that here in the chat um in zoom it would be interesting to also hear from you because i obviously um have looked at it from an academic background which as i'm researching it uh, but it would be nice to also hear from a practitioner. So please uh, shout out, let us know uh, if you've done, been working with the Amsterdam Donut. Okay, well, maybe in the meantime, I can... Oh, yeah, some people have risen their hands. Is it because you guys have uh, been working on the Amsterdam Donut? Maybe it would be interesting to hear your perspectives first as practitioners, and then I can add academic -y points <laughs> afterwards. Cool, yeah, Rita, definitely. Uh, so yeah, maybe uh, Rieta or Stan, are, are you guys working in Amsterdam? <clears throat> I'm working in Portland with Josh Alpert. Oh. And we did work with Amsterdam and Kate on a donut economy model for our city. Mm -hmm. um, I could speak on our model. Yes, please. And then Rieta, <laughs> whom I know is very involved in Amsterdam. So, so, wanna, so yeah. So Portland is in Oregon, um, United States, and we do a lot of work with New York City and also with Tokyo. So a lot of our models are really focusing on scalability, and we have a, a metro overlay. So we have a, a metro region that spans the Columbia River with the state of Washington and the state of Oregon and has about 20 cities in it. Portland is the largest city of about a hundred of uh, about a million people and a hundred neighborhoods. So we have a Cascadia bioregion that is modeled city by city, Vancouver uh, and Seattle and Portland form Cascadia. The metro region is about two million. Portland is about at half of it. And we can de decompose it into hundred neighborhoods, 15 minute neighborhoods, complete neighborhoods. 
And then the neighborhoods are decomposed into communities, BIPOC communities, elder care communities, schools, children, kinder care. And so that's a fairly interesting uh, governance model, decomposition. And we've done that a lot with uh, Hong Kong and China and Tokyo uh, in particular. The uh, Tokyo you know, is the largest city, 60 million people. And we did a lot of work with um, Kashiwa, which is their showcase elder care community, where they just talked about their second life. And so uh, we've also worked on some development standards for district scale planning called eco districts. There are about a thousand practitioners and hundreds of cities that use eco districts and the green building model, you know, lead neighborhoods. So we've scaled this across a number of, of practices. Uh, and I just like the donut economic. We're very interested in the donut economic because of that scalability, that it has a global boundary test condition that's a nice, Estadama. And then it scales down to the traditional, you know, cultural patterns of Farijas and Hutongs and uh, Kus. Um, and so it's a very adoptable model. And it's human centric, but it's also biodiversity centric. So a lot of our cities try to certify salmon certified, or my backyard actually is certified by the Audubon Society as bird friendly native species. And my wife is a medical doctor. So we downscaled the donut to the germ. Of course, COVID made us think about germ incubation quite a bit. But for those of you studying wellness and are familiar with the vagus nerve, you know, the germ population and the germ happiness of your germ farm in your gut determines wellness uh, in a very practical, contagious way. So we, we love the donut and we're very excited to be helping implement it at different scales. Thank you so much, Stan. That was very, very interesting insights. And um, I'm sending greetings to Portland. I used to live there as well for a while. Um, I was quite involved with um, Friends of Trees. I don't know if you know that NGO, they plant trees in the neighborhood with like the community. Um, so yes, nice we're, getting, we're getting a native species of dogwood today. Actually, oh, thank from, you. from Friends of Trees? That's cool. <laughs> um, nice. Okay, Rieta, you were raising your hand as well. Speaking on probably more of the um, community-driven implementation of the donut in Amsterdam. Um, yes. Yes, yeah, sorry. I jumped in also a little late, so I missed the first presentation. So I'm feeling a little bit awkward. I don't know exactly how to input at the moment. And I was actually really wondering what Martin's results were. So <laughs> I found it a little bit mean that he, uh, that he turned the order because I would like to hear him first and then uh, add my uh, context to it. But uh, so yeah, I don't know if there are specific questions uh, as Leon said, very much bottom up. Uh, very much working in the in the neighborhoods uh, with neighborhood organizations uh, and trying to practice it as um, as much as possible with uh, with the partners I work with, with the companies I work with, and the most important thing being that uh, for us it's it's the metaphor, mm -hmm. you know, it's the it's the new goal and. Um, and once you really feel that metaphor, you know, I, I, I heard a little bit about, you know, noun versus verbs and, you know, is it a label? It's not, it's a way of feeling for me, at least. I, I also like to say much more often that I am a donutter, uh, much more than, uh, or, or a lifelong student of donut economics, because it is uh, a lifelong learning and it is experimenting and, and nothing, nobody, no city, no company, uh, is a donut a company or city or person even. Um, we're far from perfect and the transition is a messy process. So, but just having it as an ideal, I think that for, for me personally, at, at least works really well. And it's a very powerful motivator uh, for me. I don't know is, <laughs> if this is the input that you were looking for, but... Could you give Let's a bit of background it. on what you've been doing uh, at the Donut? Do you work at the municipality or are you a... Uh, I don't. I don't. I've worked for the municipality, so I kind of know how it functions for a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm... Um, uh, no, I don't work for the municipality. 
Like it was just to give background, if you, so you're, it's like an immunity movement focusing on, on promoting the donut. So it's, you're part of the donut economy uh, kind of action yeah. movement. Yeah. Like from yes. Part of the, you know, I'm a member of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition. Um, uh, we've, uh, we, we organize, we're trying to set up this concept of donut bakeries to just really mm. make it very uh, easygoing and not so scary. Because I think one of the pitfalls that you can have is that you uh, modelize it really quickly and you say oh this is the donut and then these are all the categories and these are so I think that that's sometimes at least for, co for communities that doesn't really work well to yeah. really step into models uh, straight away because uh, people will always say oh I miss this or I miss that and then you have much more discussions on definitions than you have on uh, actually action plans that can be implemented hmm. well maybe briefly I can um Finally, answer. I'm sorry, Riet, I put you uh, to speak before me, uh, but I thought it was interesting from someone more directly involved than as an academic that is kind of mostly reading uh, and kind of behind the scene. Uh, not behind the scene, rather. Um, so, yeah, I mean, from my research, basically, what I was seeing is that uh, while the donut was kind of embraced by the city in its words and its discourse, um, it seemed like its actions were far from what it was portraying as what it would do. Uh, so it was talking a lot about the impact that the city has way beyond its borders on how it's, um, how economic growth could be a source of environmental impacts and how important it is to also include social justice and redistributive elements uh, in, its, in its planning approach. But yet, when you look at the actual policies, um, that the Amsterdam has so far prepared in its action plans uh, regarding the donut, there's very little social justice elements and there are some, but very uh, mostly focused on pilot projects and investments. Uh, and the problem with that is that it's, it's about inclusive development. So you're basically dependent upon future economic growth in order to kind of reinvest whatever gains you get from growth, you know, whatever gain the, the that the city gets rather than actually redistributing current unequal patterns of resource control and wealth uh, and property. So there's no real uh, redistributive approach in a more uh, transformative manner, if you will. Uh, and the social justice element is kind of predicated on the possibility that the city would grow. The actual idea of economic growth is very much latent throughout the, the, the whole plan as well. And there's a lot of uh, investment in, for example, new startups and new technologies uh, that would uh, use waste in many different ways uh, to grow and be competitive. The problem with investing in waste uh, as a source of economic growth, as a new manner for capital accumulation really, is that not only you are creating more growth, and therefore increasing your environmental impact, but also you are becoming dependent on a continuous flow of waste in order for your economy to keep functioning. So you're creating a new infrastructure for waste management that depends on the outflow of waste products uh, to exist. And therefore you are not reducing the consumption, overall consumption of products, which is much more important uh, in terms of environmental uh, friendly planning. There's also very little regarding the actual design of the urban morphology, uh, like the design of urban space. Uh, and that is, for example, creating, you know, co-housing, shared uh, property ownership structures and et cetera, that uh, uh, have a huge impact on, on, on the amount of resources that are used because they determine how much built environment uh, and how the built environment is used. Uh, and, and so by not talking about the very much the planning elements, which are not in donor economics at first, I think they're mm -hmm. missing a huge part of the impact that a city can have through the urban morphology, the way that the, the city is, is kind of established, right? Whether it's car centric and et cetera, whether it's, uh, so I think those are uh, some of the key points that I've seen. Uh, yeah, so th th I think there's still a lot to do. Uh, unfortunately. Thanks, Martin. Um, I, I think, yeah, we would 
love to continue this discussion. We had this discussion already, but Sophia also perhaps might wants to bring in some some other aspects. Sophia, yes, please. Um, I was just thinking it would be good to have uh, more of a discussion about um, some of the, I mean, we've, as we've said, being a donut city is more about a process um, than having a model or anything. Um, but one of the aspirations that it has is for everyone to thrive and every have this holistic vision. And um, I read Simon's book on the being urban and a lot of the things that um, were discussed in its chapters were about how to plan for conflict and how to, you know, integrate these things that the, the donut seems to sort of sidestep about how to be in a city. And um, I would like to ask Simon if he has any thoughts on, you know, where does that fit within this um, idea of what a city should be? How can you plan for people to thrive, but also have conflict? Thanks. Well, that, well, that's really interesting because, I mean, I would take it back beyond Vitruvius. As you know, I would go back to Plato to start the original thought about the ideal city. And Plato's initial question is, what is a just city? Not what is a good city, but what is a just city? Which is a fascinating idea because there's so much interest today in constructing a city that is not exploitative, that does not uh, exacerbate diver diversion, uh, diversity uh, or difference. Now, that's a very good idea that we should have a just city. The trouble is that where Plato leads immediately in his logic is therefore towards an authoritarian city, towards a city that excludes, it has censorship and it has certain forms of control. And the difficulty about an ideal city as a model, as an idea, is that an ideal city deliberately attempts to remove conflict. It imagines a world without conflict. It imagines a world in which people are equal or where equality lives. And for my money, it's absolutely impossible to imagine a city, to conceptualize a city in modernity, particularly if you're starting from where we are, that will not include conflict. That is to say, there will not be difference between rich and poor. There won't be difference between men and women. There won't be difference in other genders, other attitudes, other groups. And consequently, for me, the issue is not so much about uh, can you imagine the smart city, which is easy to do. We've been doing that since Plato. The trouble with the smart city is it makes everybody dumb, as my friend Richard Sennett said. <laughs> the trouble with the smart city is it allows no space for uh, serendipity, for doubt, for interaction, for meeting things you don't already know. And meeting the unknown is both frightening but necessary in an urban environment. And consequently, for me, it's about managing conflict, thinking about how you can reduce certain sorts of conflict while recognizing other sorts of conflict that that's <clears throat> crucial. And this works down to the very level of the domestic. It's the case that almost every form of architectural planning that has demanded that all the houses are the same and equal results in human beings trying to individualize their own property and try to make a statement. They want something different. They want to stand out. And we have to be very aware that the cities that we love and we love to live in are cities that are developed over time, in time, through serendipitous mistakes and effort. And actually working on that notion of the serendipitous and working on the possibility of real doubt in your civic encounters is something that the ideal city and the smart city can't bear. And I know that sounds you know, more frightening if you're in an uh, informal or a weaker position, if you're a woman, if you're an oppressed minority or whatever, of course, the city is a place where doubt turns into violence. It doesn't have to do that. But the question is, can you remove that sense of, I don't know, shadows that come with light? You can't have light without shadows in the city. And it seems to me that that's an absolutely crucial part of how we think about what the city is gonna be. So for me, on the one hand, you can't get rid of conflict and you have to think about what you're gonna deal with that when you develop. And you can't get rid of time. You know, we've got to think a little bit about the temporality of how a city develops over time and not imagine it as a synchronic event. We've got to see that you grow up, you change in your attitude to the city. What you want as a city when you're 22 is not what you want as a city when you're 72. And we have to think about how those things change over time and how the best cities are the cities that allow their own embedding in time and space, that allow for a certain degree of change rather than a belief in their own uh, unchanging idealism. And I suppose for me, one of the things that, I mean, to pick up a couple of the things that were mentioned that we might think about is, well, how do we portray the city to ourselves? 
how does a city represent itself to itself is so important in constructing the imaginary of a city, which is why Sophia's pictures were so great. <laughs> because you could see how people were trying to imagine the city and represent the city to themselves. And how you represent the city to yourself in an imaginary way is also the way in which you try and live in the city. And so much of what we have at the moment is stories about what a good city would look like without stories about how you live in the city. And actually living in a city, experiencing a city, both as a physical space and as an interactive social space, is something we need to imagine better than we do at the moment to make sense of a city. And I think that's a really, really important part of what we need to do to change the city. And what I find fascinating is that Sophia gave us Hausmann's Paris as one of the models. And one of the things in the 19th century is everywhere you look, people were talking about Paris. They were doing plays about Paris. They were showing artwork about Paris. They were showing film, films later in the 19th century, 20th century about Paris. And Paris becomes a city of the imaginary very quickly. But it also changes how people live in Paris, how people experience that city. And so seeing that interaction between, as it were, rules of engagement and possibilities of engagement and action of en actualities of engagement is something we need to do in our city planning. And the hardest thing of all in all of that, which, which I think the donut is trying to do, but I don't know if it's quite made it, is to think about the difficulty and necessity of integrated planning. The donut, by giving you that circle, says oh, everything is included in here. But if you ask, okay, how do you actually relate transport to social good? How do you actually relate education to social change? How do you relate water to infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera? Those are issues that all are integrated and are incredibly hard to put together in any real planning way. And that to me is one of the overwhelming problems of civic, of civic life at the moment is that the city is such a complex place with so many highly technical, difficult areas that we need to put together. And putting them together involves who involve, who's gonna govern, who has impact on how things are gonna change. I mean, I've done a little bit of work recently with mayors from South American cities. And you just look at the cities which have these huge freeways through the middle of the city. You ask, whose idea was it to put a freeway through the middle of a city? What a stupid idea, what does it do to social life? And the immediate answer was people who don't live there. And that's true that your planners don't live in the place they plan. <laughs> that's really bad news. You have to have, as it were, indigenous groups of all sorts involved in that planning, or you're going to end up in some really, really crazy ways in which the commons get misused. And that sort of integration is very hard to organize politically, socially, intellectually, and just technocratically. So hard to get an engineer who does roads to think about how's that going to affect the school? How's that going to affect where you drink, you know? Roads are so much more important for getting people in and out of towns. So they forget that actually, you know, the Italian square, the piazza, where you can only drive through if people stop walking in front of you is perhaps a better model for transport. <laughs> At least for me it is. And then the final thing I'd say, I love the fact you brought up Howard and the Garden City Movement, which as you know, Sophia, is very dear to my intellectual heart. And I'll end, leave with one very small point, which is, um, the great founder, the great modeler of Jerusalem in the early 20th century was a man called Charlie Ashby, who was grown up on the uh, English garden city movement. Howard was one of his great models, and he, in fact, is responsible for a lot of the city planning in Jerusalem that is still observed. But what he said at one point was that if you look at Letchworth, just outside Cambridge's garden city, incredibly bourgeois, flat place, he says, it's exactly the same as Jerusalem in its structure. <laughs> and I suppose I mention this because when you see very smart people say extremely stupid things, because Letchworth is not like Jerusalem at all. <laughs> in no way is it like Jerusalem in any sense. When you see very smart people say very stupid things, that's when you see ideology in action. Mm. And we must remember that the idealism that allows you to think that Letchworth and Jerusalem are analogies is an idealism we share. So when I say the ideal city is the authoritarian model we have to observe, avoid, we have to remember that we also share that idealism in our hearts at certain points. And we have to aware of that dynamic between idealism and practicality and try and find ourselves, if you like, as pragmatic idealists.
And so that's that's what I would say would be my response to the donut. Thanks a lot, uh, Simon. <laughs> it resonates, I think, to, to many. It, uh, it's uh, philosophical and uh, also, but all then, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> shouting out for us to be a, a pragmatic idealist. That's very nice. I would give Leonora the chance to respond and to pick up on her thoughts on what has been discussed. Leonora, please. Thank you. And Simon, what what rich reflections, really. I uh, have to say, I wrote down your quotes about uh, when you say, <laughs> hear smart people saying stupid things, you see ideology in action. What a, what a piece of wisdom unrelated to this. Um, but I wanted to pick up on a on, on few things that you were reflecting on, specifically about the pragmatic reality of cities today, which aren't the same as, as cities throughout history. And which I think we're in more, um, we're a bit more aware uh, of the complications that they're facing. And I, I want to talk to two sides of it. One is what cities actually are today. And we're talking here as if we have a very kind of common understanding between us, but what cities are, but there actually isn't a firmly defined international definition of cities, of you know what constitutes a city, what are the boundaries uh, of, of cities and the realities of cities today, of city administrations today, is that this this in itself is a big challenge because the kind of the built environment, the built footprint of cities often doesn't overlap with the administrative jurisdiction of cities, and and therefore this this becomes a big part of you know what what are we even talking about when we're talking about cities here? What cities are in some some countries are one continuous sprawl of of development. Um, and, and, and some countries are rarely in our cities that firmly define space that most of these ideal cities were, were kind of setting, drawing on, on, on a blueprint. And one thing that a donut brings, uh, in my view, the four lenses of the donut bring, I think, an invitation for us to question the, def the very definition of what cities are and what the boundaries of cities are. Uh, and the four lenses, and you know, and in particular, kind of the, the local ecological lens, the global ecological lens, the global social lens, are inviting us to move our definition of cities beyond the built environment footprint. Because in reality, the ecological footprint of cities goes way beyond that. The social footprint and the impact on communities world goes way beyond that. And the relationships, the connections, whether it's whether it's trade, whether it's transport, whether it's flow of people, of material, of resources, of capital, makes cities very very high to contain and define. And this is, it can be a very, uh, a, a, a very freezing thing to, to think about as well, because you're like, well, you know, then then where do you start? But I, it is important, I, I think, for for everybody working in cities today to be recognizing that and. and and the four lenses of Donut are kind of a constant reminder of the changing definition of cities that we need to be aware of. Um, and then the other thing is what we raised, Simon, about the, the challenge of integrated planning, the, the, the way you, I think, so, um, so rightly put it is where the, what the Donut is aiming to, uh, to kind of move, up, move us towards that holistic view, but is it actually uh, doing it? And, one couldn't, I mean, donut economics and donut economics in practice in cities is not a firmly defined field. It's a, it's a, it's an evolving practice that all of us are co-creating here in a very exciting time that we find ourselves in. But there isn't a how-to guide. There isn't a step-by-step -step, uh, guide. And, and integrated planning, as you're saying, in practice is a is a very big challenge. What I think that the donut is bringing uh, that's that's helping us address it is actually opening up that holistic view because in the reality, in the pragmatic realities of cities, city administrations were designed, the systems of city administrations were designed based on outdated paradigms at this point, based on 20th century paradigms. They weren't designed around the systems thinking that we need in cities. They weren't designed to be helping cities move towards the donut. And therefore, they're functioning, they're very compartmentalized in working in silos, working in sectors, very separated. And, and it is a challenge for city administrations, for cities, for city practitioners to be bridging these this silos. And the donut allows an easy, an easy entry point to, to start tackling that challenge. It's actually a place where you know, people 
from different sectors start having those conversations. It doesn't have the solutions yet. It never will. Only local places will have their own so local solutions on how to actually integrate, you know, transport with water management, social justice with housing policy. But it opens up the conversations between those that are managing it and that are leaving the impacts of it. And, and I think it's a, it's a crucial challenge of our, our cities today. And, and, and I see that that's one of the things, kind of the early things that I see that Donut brings to, in the practice of city administration is that move towards that, the bridging of the silos and kind of a step towards integrated planning. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Lonora. I think um, it's, it's this um, um, idea of um, yeah, really coming to bringing all the stakeholders together and, and putting them to think together about what is the city that we want to achieve and how that also connects to the, all the surrounding and all to the global, to, to the global uh, aspects of it. I think, Rieta, do you want to comment on something or do you have a question? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I wanted to comment. Thanks, uh, Leonora, for uh, explaining. I think you explained really well that uh, it is an experiment and we're all learning uh, and designing and co-creating together. Uh, what I would prefer seeing in Amsterdam, Amsterdam being it is the city that has so much captured the imagination, which is a good thing, of all the cities across the, the globe, uh, proclaiming that it is going to embrace this donut model and uh, because it shows the power of communication and how careful we should be on how we discuss these things. If if we had a if we had a alderman that said we're going to embrace the donut, but be mindful, I'm only one of seven eight aldermen, and you know this is also still a very much an internal process. I would have respected it more. And I think a lot of people would have respected it more. And it, this, this goes for everybody, you know, just like I, I, I think uh, in Amsterdam, I'm, I'm pretty one of the most active people <laughs> with, with, with regards to the donut. But I, I, I say immediately, it's a learning process. I don't have the answers. I am experimenting. We are not there yet. But and, and so we, you know, it's, it's great to have this model because it's, it is more than a metaphor. I love the complete book and all the, the seven ways on how to think as a 21st century economist. The structure of the book is amazing. If you haven't read it well, uh, yet, please do. It's still one of my favorite books. So there's still there's a lot of work already done. And the, the deal team is doing amazing work as well, trying to explore all these uh, different pillars. But I think, why don't we, why aren't we more truthful in terms of our communication? That would already help so much. So instead of the debates, instead of the, the friction that you get, why aren't we just more embracing, we don't know it yet, but we're not going to let go. We are still going to persist. This is still our ideal. That would, that would create much more uh, better processes and collaboration, I think. So that's the point. The communication point is the point that I wanted to make. Thanks, Rieta. And if I may comment just in between uh, before handing to Stan, I think he wants to say something as well. I think it's what Leonora said. We still need to change the mindset and change the way that we are looking at the challenges in the 21st century, right? We're still sometimes trying to solve this with the same kind of thinking that created the problems in the first place. So, and I see the role of, for example, of education, when we talk about how, how are we educating our children? Are, are they coming with this new mindset of collaboration, of co-creation, of breaking the silos, of really looking at the things in a system thinking way? Uh, I, I have children in school and it's not working. And I don't know how, how is that going to work for the 21st century, but that still we need this communication and honesty of saying, okay, we are embracing this and we still don't know. But um, yeah, Stan, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you. I, well, first of all, I love this session. And then I love what Rietta said about this as a process. And then I think, you know, besides Amsterdam as an inspirational city or Paris or Barcelona or London, the acre, the square mile, um, <clears throat> you know, we're, I got inspired to this with Josh Alpert. He's a C40 Thriving Cities Initiative. So 40 different cities. And by my daughter, basically challenge, you know, I was trying to explain to her, okay, Doomer, 
and she was giving me okay boomer kinds of questions and and then it's a process for me to sort of figure this out and uh do it in my backyard with the trees still to come you know um more plantings so so i really love the process and then i think the donut is a really interesting you know geometric shape for equity equidistance uh in a lot of dimensions um but the idea that there's one donut of a city or one donut of a community you know actually in a neighborhood there are multiple communities of different size so it's not one clean donut i think it is a there's actually a, a warp and a woof of placemaking kind of biome donut tests but also some global tests for gender and for language and for and birds you know migratory species so there's a warp and a woof to that and i think it's more than one donut it's a weaving of cross donuts and i think that that process of weaving is part of the process or i actually like the language of regenerative as sort of a, of a test of the property of the fabric um but i just wanted to mention you know it's a really good discussions and i think this is part of uh, managing the commons uh so so yes. thank you thanks uh, stan um it resonates to me what you say and um and I, what i would like to see is really that we are reimagine our a place or we are redefining our place in nature and in this earth that's the starting point also so for for us to to then think about also this this uh yeah how, how is the city that we want to leave since we are losing a lot of people already and we um almost uh finished and uh we want, don't want to to uh, move for for past uh, uh nine in europe i i'd say it has been amazing i think we could listen to uh leonora and simon and martin and rietta to for a longer time Perhaps we should organize a, a second uh, follow-up uh, and see how, how we continue the exchange. But um, for now, thanks for, for all your thoughts, all your ideas in the chat as well. We will uh, save that and try to summarize that somehow also for, for the results. And with that, uh, I'd say Leon, Sophia, feel free to wrap up. Um, or Simon, did you want to say something also? No, I was just saying thank you and goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts. It was amazing. Really philosophical. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody for taking the time to be here of two hours of your evening. And it's been great to discuss with you. Yeah, thank you also from my side. It's been really a pleasure, Simon. I'm definitely going to read your book. Um, that's totally what I'm doing in my research at the moment as well. Um, and yeah, just reiterating, if you feel like you liked it, don't, don't hesitate in making a little donation, um, so that we can sort of, yeah, to support our work and that we can do this again. Um, I, yeah, I will send around another email, um, with links, ways to reach out. Um, if you have more questions, um, just don't hesitate to, to send them. Um, I have most of your people's emails as soon as you registered through Eventbrite. Um, and we'll make sure that you get results once they're distilled into either a paper format or to some sort of a presentation. Um, yeah, thank you so, so, so much. Um, Perhaps we could, we could finish yeah. with those who are there still and want to turn on your cameras. Uh, if you have the donut near you, you can take it and we can make a group picture of at least the ones who want to be in the picture. <laughs> Sophia is taking something round. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the book, everybody just say, uh, uh, how, how is it called in English for when you smile? It's uh, cheese. spaghetti. Cheese. <laughs> cheese. Say cheese. <laughs> <laughs> everybody with the donut. Nice. That's a nice picture. Very oh. good. Brian, Ursula, yes, very nice, Sabina, Nagata. <laughs> let me, cool. let me just do the, the second, uh, just, just one moment. Yeah, and then I see some other faces. Great. Okay, then we can close. We, we are staying a bit if someone wants to stay and chat, but all the, the, the ones who, can, who wants to go can go. <laughs> Is it okay? 
I just spilled coffee all over my table because <laughs> <laughs> cup was not my fault. Sorry, Leon, what did you say? Oh, okay. I was just I was just chatting informally, saying I spilled coffee over my table. You spilled <laughs> coffee, oh my god. Not yeah, in the on the computer, I hope. Mm, All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop the recording so we can chat uh, off the record.